Another thing is the first part of this workshop will be what we call a circle. And from the circle, we're going to go into movement exercises, which will be based on improvisational theater exercises developed by a woman named Viola Spola. And then from there, we'll do a little bit of singing. So basically, the workshop will be in three parts. After that, if you want to leave, you can leave, you can leave early. And then the sit down and do the pencil and paper. We brought enough paper and pencil for all of you. And my goal tonight is, besides having some fun and acting like a bunch of kids and kind of getting bonding and getting comfortable with each other so we can be foolish, um, uh, I'm going to try to show you actually how to dictate rhythm tonight. Before you leave this evening, you will be able to hear rhythms or music and write it down. So my goal is, in roughly 15 minutes, I'm going to teach you to do something that took me over two years in college to learn to do. I have developed these, what I call, I've developed these instantaneous uh, ways of transmitting music knowledge uh, that's so basic uh, people can catch on. Some of my students here already know what code words are. But the nice thing about code words is you should be able to actually read and write some basic rhythms before you leave here tonight. So that's, that's my goal. So uh, we'll have some fun and we'll, we'll do some knowledge. So if everybody could just push their chairs back. you want. And then after that I'll say, come into sync, and I want us to get back to this. You ready? <laughs> Chaos. Sync. <laughs> Chaos. Sync. <laughs> Chaos. Now you see how fast we were able to get in sync after a while. This is called unconscious consensus. And when you're working in a group, there has to be a part of you that's using ESP all the time, sensing everybody and everything. And when everyone wants to start playing the same thing, it's got to go there and not say, well, I'm the greatest one here and we ought to do it my way. Well, let's stop. Hey, now switch legs. And back down. Okay. Now, what we're going to do this time is, this time we're going to take our hands and swing our hands way up in the air and then bend forward like this. Okay? Let's grab hands. <laughs> Ready? In sync. Down. Up. Down. Okay, now this time, this time, we're going to do that four times. And on the fifth time, I want everyone to yell as loud as they can the worst, nastiest cuss word you can think of. Ah. Serious. Serious. The dirtiest, filthiest thing that comes out of your mouth. You ready? One. Are we bombing yet? Shucks. 
<laughs> now, that's a way of getting rid of all the crap that we brought in here from outside. So what we do here is save. And that's a good way to get rid of tension from the group. Get in and get yourself ready to hop into the circle. Okay, now what we're going to do is, the first thing in music is known as the heart, the beat. My heart beats. And one of the first things we have to do as a group is actually get our heartbeats. You'll find that when groups are playing together, if their hearts are synchronized, the rhythm becomes incredible. Now, anytime you've ever seen a band like Dave Brubeck, where he's playing with his sons, you'll notice that when there's that biological connection in the band, that rhythm's even more intense. And there's things that they can do that nobody else can do. So if we can get our heartbeats in sync with each other, we can do better rhythmic work, better rhythmic things. So the first thing is, it all comes from the heartbeat. Now the heart pushes blood through our veins and creates what we call a pulse. A pulse. And the difference between a pulse and a beat is a beat is just an electrical impulse that shocks the heart to get it to move. <clears throat> But the pulse is the lifeblood itself. In music, we have what's called metronomic rhythm, and we have what people call the groove. When you are grooving, you are playing metronomically, but you're playing with life. You're imbuing, as God once said, rush. You're putting rush. You're putting the gift of life into the rhythm. So it's not just what we would called undifferentiated pulse, it's pulse that <laughs> grooves. Now there was a big debate. Uh, Count Basie and Stan Kenton once had a big debate. Stan Kenton said one note cannot groove. Count Basie said of course one note can groove. So Stan Kenton sat down at the piano and he went, dumb. And Count Basie said, I agree, that doesn't groove at all. <laughs> Not at all. So Stan Ken said, you do it. Count Basie walked over and he went, bomb. <laughs> Can you see the difference? Can you feel the difference? That groove. Why? Because he prepared himself internally. He had his internal clock, put some life into that, and then breathing that life into that single note that he played, that life comes out, jumps right at us, okay? That's the difference between pulse and, and beat. So what we're going to do right now is we're just going to start by clapping our hands together and get a beat going. Everybody just start. Now the first thing we can do with the beat, get it all nice and steady. We're going to start to speed up. Listen to me. Slowing down. First thing I want to ask you, how did it feel when we stood up? Great. Great. <laughs> Exciting. Exciting. That's sort of yeah. Exciting. We put energy into something. What about when we slow down? Yeah, it's a bit upsetting. Relaxing. Relaxing. Going to sleep. So I can put emotion into something as simple as clapping my hands just by speeding it up and slowing it down. And then I speed it up and slow it down with my heart, with my feelings, if I do it with emotional intent, it comes across to you. You can identify with what I'm doing, project, it's called projection, and identify with it and say, hey, I feel that groove. I feel that groove, okay? Speeding up, excitement. Slowing down, <coughs> calming. Okay, now this time, we're going to keep trying to do simple things and build, because less is more. Less is more. It's better that we are all 
professional amateurs than lousy amateur professionals. What we're going to do now is pass the pulse around. I'll clap, then Angel will clap, then her, then him, then him, <laughs> and it will go all the way around the circle. Now the important thing is to try to keep that pulse steady. And when other people are clapping, you have to give them your energy. You have to concentrate and focus to sort of help them. If they screw up, just the next person, pick it up and just keep on taking it around. You ready? Just keep on going. You help someone when they screw up by not paying attention to them. <laughs> you support them. You support them by being right. The best way to support someone is by being right. If you screw up and you pass it around in theater, that's called chuckle fucking. <laughs> it's like yawning and everybody yawns or pulling out a cigarette and everybody starts smoking. See, and you don't want to do anything. Actually, in a really good orchestra, I could make mistakes with confidence and then play them again and you'll think I'm playing jazz. <laughs> you won't always admit I can have the attitude that I didn't make a mistake and it won't be. But if I go... <clears throat> then you just told the audience that you made a mistake, you told everyone in the band you made a mistake, and then we all do that, and it gets out of control. See what I'm saying? So just focus here now. As simple as this is, it's going to get harder. Are you ready? One, two, and I start. Okay, now what we're going to do is, I'm going to 
play, and I'm going to slowly speed it up. And we're going to see how fast we can get this thing going, and you guys still stay with it, all right? So you've got to really focus here and now. If you find yourself looking around or you're not ready, it'll bite you in the ass. <laughs> okay? We'll start with you this time. One, two, ready, go. Pulse, pulse, pulse. two or three people kneeling at any one time, you've got to watch the person on either side of you. Another piece of advice, don't wait until the pulse gets here and then kneel. <laughs> you can see that's not good communication. Wait until the pulse passes you, make up your mind whether you're going to kneel or not. After you do your bit in the band, get out of the band for a minute. Then when you come back up, what's the best time to come back up? Right after. Right after, right after it passes you. Ta-da! Think you can do this? You ready? I'll be in it with you. I'll start. One, two, ready, go. Pulse, 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 pulse. screeching halt. Alright? I also had a friend here kneel down just before the pulse got to me. I didn't let it <laughs> I didn't let it affect me. You know why? Because I saw his intention before he started. The moment the thing hit his brain, I was already sensing his body language, knew he was gonna do that to me. <laughs> and I, I was ready, right? What happened over here when he got down before she got a chance. What did she do? She hiccuped and laughed. Now you know why we call it chuckle bucking. <laughs> what happened when she laughed? The next few people after that had a hard time. Yeah, took time for them to catch up. So again, we can't, if somebody screws up in the band, we can't have the whole band come to a screeching halt. The best way you can support someone when they goof up is to do your bit on your time when you're ready. But just keep on trucking. <laughs> just keep on trucking, okay? All right, let's get everybody else back out here again. Give them a circle. Come on in, join us, please. The water's just fine. <laughs> Let's get out of here. All right, that was pulse. 
And it's just a simple thing of us as a group trying to hold the pulse together and not allow what each of us is doing as an individual to affect the whole group. It also gives us an opportunity to solo and put out our thing when it's our turn. And in order to do this, you have to, one, stay in the piece with everybody else, whether you're out or whether you're up, you have to stay focused. And as that pulse is going around, you kind of have to wish everybody around the circle because your active wishing for them to succeed actually helps them. They pick up on that. They feel that on that level. And it helps to support them. If you're spacing out, then the people near you will space out. If you're talking to your next door neighbor, it'll interfere with the entire group process. Got that so far? Okay. Now, this next thing is, I'm going to play a rhythm, and then I want you all to clap that rhythm back to me. Okay? So just listen very carefully. Everybody? You're starting to get it, okay? As simple as this is, trust me, I can make it really hard. <laughs> I'm just going to try to take it in steps. Again, better to be a professional amateur than the other way around. Do less, better. Do less, as good as you can. Then add one more element to make it complicated. Get that down so you're comfortable with it. Then add one more element to make that. I don't like to use the word L. Ron Hubbard too much, uh, but he called this gradient. Whenever you're trying to solve a problem, break the problem down into smaller units. If you make it too small, you'll bore yourself. If it's too complicated, you can't win. You're practicing failure. But you can break anything down small enough that you can succeed. So you break something down into smaller units that you can handle. You work on it until you win. And you always create a win, 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 win scenario. This brings you the confidence to move to the next higher level and higher level and higher level. Trust me, Chopin went through it. Beethoven went through it. Mozart went through it. No matter how much innate talent a person has, there's a certain amount of practicing that they have to do in which they break things down into smaller units and build them back up till they become more complicated. Now what we just did was called imitation. I played something, then you did it. I played something, you did it. Rhythm is not the only way we can imitate something. We can also imitate something, for instance, with our voice. So I'm going to sing something, then I want you to sing it back. Okay? And we're going to do what we call call and response. Everybody ready? Verashaka, Verashaka, Dome Bu. Son of Lanatina, Son of Lanatina, Din Din Don, Din Din Don, Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? Brother John, Brother John, Morning bells are ringing, Morning bells are ringing, Ding Dong Ding, Ding Dong Ding. Now you can see that entire song was actually built on call and response. Every single measure of that song is repeated. There are other songs where that's not true. For instance, Yankee Doodle. Every measure of Yankee Doodle is completely unique and different and never repeats itself. So in this first one, we call that A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. That's the song form used. But in Yankee Doodle, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A lot of repeating is done in music. And these song forms are large architectural structures that we just plug in anything we want to into that architectural structure to create songs. 
Now I'll give you another example of call and response, and also it's called question and answer. Okay? The first stanza that I'm going to yell out, I want you to repeat to me. And then the third one, I'll yell back all by myself. You don't have to respond to it. And what it will be is an answer to what we just did. Then I will say something else, you'll repeat it, and then I'll answer it. So we're going to have what we call A-A-B. A-A-B. You ready? I ain't no ice man. I ain't no ice man, son. Your turn. I ain't no ice man. I ain't no ice man, son. But I can keep you cool, babe. Everybody, until the ice man comes. I ain't no stove man. I ain't no stove man, son. I ain't no stove man. I ain't no stove man, son. But I can chop a quart of wood, babe. Until that stove man comes. I ain't no butcher. I ain't no butcher, son. I ain't no butcher. I ain't no butcher, son. But I can furnish your meat, babe. Until that butcher comes. I ain't no milkman. I ain't no milkman, son. I ain't no milkman. I ain't no milkman, son. But I can furnish your cream, babe. Until the milkman comes. Now that is the blues, ladies and gentlemen. That's the form that is used for almost all blues. You have a stanza, then that stanza is repeated in a slightly different chord change, and then that question that has been raised is answered. Also in the good blues, as the piece goes on, it becomes sexier and sexier and, and dirtier and dirtier. <laughs> And, and what we just sang was a short version of Cow Cow Davensport, I Ain't No Ice Man. That was written in about 1890 and was not recorded until 1926. It was one of the first recordings that Edison, Edison put on, on discs by Cow Cow Davenport. Okay? Then there's lots more verses. Also in the blues, you should make up your own. After you sing someone's blues song, the last Stanza, you make up your own thing. So I made up one to that. I ain't no pirate. I ain't no pirate, son. I ain't no pirate. I ain't no pirate, son. But if you show me all your treasures, babe, I'm gonna get me some. That was mine, friend. Okay? Thank you. All right, now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to play a rhythm, then Angel will play it, and then you play it, and you play it, and we'll pass the rhythm around, just as we were doing with the count off, okay? This time, rhythmic accuracy, listen to it carefully, and as it moves from person to person, I don't want to hear the telephone game where it gets changed and comes back to me in a different form. The idea is to keep it exactly the same. You ready?
teach you the code words so we can do this again and it'll help hold it together. Okay? The first code word is drum. Everybody together. Drum. Drum. That's the first code word. Second code word is a two-syllable word played in the same amount of time. In a single beat, we're going to say Tarzan. Tarzan. possibilities with those two code words. Listen carefully and see if you can hear what I'm doing. Listen again. One more time. What is drum? Tarzan, Tarzan, drum. Okay, I'll say I'll do it, you say it. Tarzan, Tarzan, drum. Drum, Tarzan, Tarzan, drum. Tarzan, 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 drum. Drum, Tarzan, drum, Tarzan. Tarzan, Tarzan, drum, drum. Drum, 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 Tarzan. Got it? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the <gasps> passing the pulse around the circle. Each taking one beat. Either one. But remember, when you do Tarzan, it has to be done in one beat. It has to be done in your pulse. And what we should get <laughs> is we should get some rhythms happening here, some code word rhythms, just sort of generating random rhythms as they go. Now remember, all you have to do is decide before it gets to you, like with the kneeling, whether you want to do a drum or a Tarzan. You ready? Can we say the word too? <coughs> be best if you say it. Okay. You'll find if you say the word it helps. Okay? Ready? I'm gonna start. Tarzan. Tarzan. Drum. Go on, Tarzan. Tarzan. Bum 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 b
bum 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 bum. What'd you hear? Tarzan drum, Tarzan drum, Tarzan drum, Tarzan drum, Tarzan drum, Tarzan drum, Tarzan, Tarzan, Tarzan drum. Right? And you all heard it, right? One more. Bum 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 bum. Drum, drum, Tarzan, Tarzan, drum, drum, drum. You got it, okay? So right now, you can read music. All you need to do is, all you need to do is see what those symbols look like, and I'll show you that at the end of this. Now, quickly, this is a game I call the name game. And it's a way in which we can all figure out each other's name in a way in which we can kind of get it seared into our memory, okay? And the way it starts is, I give my name, then Angel says my name, and then her name. And you say my name, her name, and your name. Don't worry, I'll be back. Now, I cannot remember names to save my life, but I'll be last here, okay? I'll sacrifice myself on the altar for you all just to show you that I have courage. <laughs> Power. Okay? You ready? Natural. Natural Angel. Natural Angel Kathleen. Natural Angel Kathleen Starshine. Natural Angel Starshine. Kathleen Starshine Roger. Natural Angel Kathleen Starshine Roger. Natural Angel Kathleen Sarjan? Starshine. Starshine. Roger. Angel. Kathleen. And you're Jeff? Natural Angel Kathleen Starshine Roger Kathleen Jeff Oscar. Natural Angel Kathleen Starshine Roger Kathleen Jeff Oscar. Oscar. Natural Angel Kathy Starshine Roger Kathy Wait, you were Kathy Kathy Jeff Aja Bear James Natural Angel Kathy Starshine Roger Kathy Jeff Asha Bear James Evan Natural Angel Kathleen Starshine Roger Kathy Jeff Asha Bear James Evan yep. Richard Richard <laughs> 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 Focus Mr. Atro himself Angel Kathleen Starshine Roger Kathy Jeff Asha, Bear, James, Evan, Richard. Nice to meet you. And you are? Mary. <laughs> Natural, Angel, Kathleen, Starshine, Roger, Kathy, Jeff, Asha, Bear, James, Evan, Richard, Mary. DC. Natural, Angel, Kathleen, Starshine, Roger, Kathy, Jeff, Asha, Bear, James, Evan, Richard, Mary, <laughs> <DC. laughs> and you, Paul. Oh. <laughs> 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 Natural Angel, Kathleen, Starshine, Roger, Kathy, Jeff, Asha, Bear, James, Evan, Richard, Mary, DC, Paul, Tony. Mr. Natural, Angel, Kathleen, Starshine, Roger, Kathy, Jeff, Asha, Bear, James, Evan, Richard, Mary, DC, Paul, <gasps> Tony, <laughs> Barbara. Natural, Angel, Kathleen, Starshine, Roger, Kathy, Alan, Jeff. Jeff. Mm -hmm. Bear. Uh, uh, 
workshop I'll show you the actual symbol and then I'm going to give you a little test and we're just going to put these three code words together in some <coughs> order and then what I want you to do is write down on a piece of paper the rhythm 
And if we can do that by the end of the night, I'll be a happy man, and you should all be happy campers, because you're doing something it took me two years to do in college, which is <laughs> dictation, which can be done in just a few minutes if you use these. Now, for this part, what we're going to do is we're going to just walk around through this space aimlessly, everyone going in different directions, exploring the space with our bodies as much as we can. It's called space exercise. So everybody just start walking. Now the idea of this is to walk with intent. So I know where I'm going. My face and my mind is in front of me. And as I go, other people can tell where I'm going. I don't want to go too fast. When I crash into other people, and I want to kind of move around the space and explore randomly. The other thing is to keep your mind about you because you should know who's on either side of you if I suddenly say the word freeze. Okay, look around you and see who's around you. Okay, I got Angel, Roger, Paul, Tony, they are next to me. And then that guy's Bob. <laughs> Bob's. Bob. Are, are you aware of who's around you? No. Okay, start again. Space. This, by the way, in theater is called self-blocking. <laughs> the idea is to cover as much of the space as we can keep covered without crowding ourselves in any one particular place. I'm late. And go with some intention. Okay, so everybody is aware. And try to be aware of where everybody else is at. Until I say, freeze. Now look around and see who's around you. Are those the people that you knew were there? Especially behind you. You should get to the point where even if people cross behind you and you stop, you should know who's back there. Because one of the things about being on stage is you have to be aware of every, every area of the space and everyone who's on the space at once. All right, start the free space again. Now, this time we're going to very slowly speed up. And we're not using all the space. It's all the space out here. We seem to be allowing that rug to determine where our mind should start to stop. Don't let that rug be a fascist. No. That's it. Explore more of the space. Walk with intent. Keep your mind about you. around and see who's around you. Are you getting better at guessing who's near you? Don't say yes because I might test you. Okay? Again, start the space again. Now what we're going to do is very slowly speed up. Now the problem with this is slowly don't let someone speed up too fast and don't get out of control so we have major accidents. On the Only go as fast as you can stay in control. A little bit faster. That's it. Some people are taking big trucking steps. That's good. Great. Look around you. Pretty much the people you thought were there. Are you developing ESP? That means extra super peepers. For those of you. You have to learn to use your peripheral vision when you're doing that. Right. Start again at a normal speed. Okay, now we're going to very slowly start to slow down. Now, when you slow down, I, it's not Million Dollar Man. Okay, it's not that where he's running fast and they do it in slow motion. Don't exaggerate your body motion just because you're going slower. Have everything still work pretty much the way it's working. 
and try to be aware of who's around you. Slower. That's it. Nice normal body motion. And slower. And slower. And come to a creep. And halt. Now look around and see if we've filled out all the space. You can see there's a big hole over there in that corner. But there were some people who had, see Bob again was on his way there. <laughs> okay. Now this time what we're going to do is, Angel and I, are as we're walking around doing space, we're going to start a motion. And what you have to do is, when you see that motion in front of you, start imitating it. Now don't wait until you see me or her. If you see other people doing a motion, pick up whatever motion is closest to you. Start doing that motion until you see it change. Then change. I'll change the motion. She'll change the motion. And everyone will take turns changing the motion. So again, we're imitating. It's all about imitation. Free space, please. Yes, they can copy you or they can copy me. So there should be two motions going on all the time. switching, I switched to what she did, we kept one motion going. So even though there were two mirroring leaders, there was still only one motion going on, and I could see it move around the room through what we call consensus. Okay, now, grab yourself a partner. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got to... <laughs> 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 what the is? Why don't you go over there? Oh, yeah. okay. uh, <laughs> Good. So everybody has a partner. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I want you to face each other. And right now, determine who's going to be the leader. Let's decide. Decide. Has everyone decided who the leader is? All right, now what I want you to do is put your palms against each other. Now, what the leader is going to do is the leader is going to start some motion and move their palms around, and the other person is supposed to follow them. Please continue go. Now, don't go too fast. The leader's job is to gain the other person's trust and then start to exaggerate the motions to make sure that the other person follows. 
The person who's following, their job is to try to follow. If you cannot follow, then please look worried. <laughs> Do something with your face. Look the other person right in the eye and go, help. Because <laughs> their job is not to overwhelm you. Their job is not to show you how superior they are. Their job is to lead you gently, peacefully, into something and start making an extrasensory connection with each other. Now you can explore more than just the hands. You can go, you can explore space. You can start walking around. But never let your hands part. You try Kung Fu moves, dance moves. Remember, the leader is the leader. Your job is to lead the other person gently. Now, in a minute, I'm going to say reverse. And when I say reverse, the leader becomes the follower, and the follower becomes the leader, so this is where you can get even. Reverse. Now, the follower is the leader. The leader is the follower. Let's see if you can do a better job. <laughs> okay, here what's where we get even with getting even. Reverse! Back to the original leader. Show them what you like first. Show them what you like. Yeah. This is like giving your partner a back rub. You don't want to. You don't want to hurt them and then give them an opportunity to do that to you. Reverse. Right. Yeah. Explore more space. Take it somewhere. Yeah, that's it, James. You have 360 degrees of space you can explore. <laughs> now very slowly, bring it to an end. However you want to end it. Spirals, of course. <laughs> Bring it to a center, relax, and find your peace. That's what this is really about, finding your moment of peace. Now the same thing can be done, let's get back in the circle. Places. This time, we're just going to have one leader, and we're all going to follow that person in palm dancing, but we won't actually touch. This time we'll have the space between us. Angel is going to be the leader, and we have to follow and imitate her as exactly as we can. She'll start however she wants to start, starting now. Don't move too fast. She has to watch the whole group and sense what we're all doing. And take it as slowly as the slowest person. Sometimes she can do things behind her back and we should still kind of be able to tell from whatever parts we can see what's going on. Tai Chi. How did that all feel? Okay. Did you feel the connection between her and yourselves? Yes. Was anybody worried she was going a little too fast and kind of throw a little ESP message? See, and then if she gets it, she'll slow down. The idea is she has to sense all of you at once. You feel all of your consciousness to make sure that she's doing the what's best for the slowest. Now we're watching Asha.
внутри пара. anybody but them. Okay? Try to get your cues from everybody else. His job, he's going to come in and now take it slow. Because if you go too fast, it'll be obvious that you're starting it. And the idea is he has to come in here and he has to look at the group and try to figure out who it is that's starting the motion. If we're all in sync, we won't be able to tell. Okay, you ready? Start. Everyone follow him. Look at somebody else. This is one of the mirroring leaders. That's one of the mirroring leaders. We'll take it slow. That's it. A little bit slower. Okay, come on in, Starshine. Your job is to figure out who is the mirroring leader. start mouthing the words that you're saying, <laughs> even if it comes out, oh, say, can you believe I the contour me, my avatar feel last to be. As long as it looks like you're in. So that's another way in which mirroring happens, and often that's used in chorus. Okay, now, five minutes, we're going to do some vocal stuff. The first thing I want us to do is relax, take a deep breath, think of a sound, and when I say yell, I want you all to yell that sound, whatever it is. And just hold it as long as you can. You ready? Yell. Oh! Again, get yourself another sound, and we're going to yell it again, and then I'll cut us off. You ready? One, two, go. <laughs> now this time, I'm going to sing a note, and I want you all to match my note, and sing it as long as you can. Ready? Do. Yes, 
Only five of us were killed. Only five of us were killed. Only five of us were killed. So you can see how that works. And basically, which doctors use this call and response as a way to actually teach the history of the child. Now, what happened is, later on, that became, uh, you know, witch doctors started using that as part of their mantras and chants to help chase the evil spirits away and the demons out of people's lives. So a lot of ritual chants come from this call and response as well. So it initially started as basically a history lesson and a way of passing on information within the tribe orally and then later it, it would break off and individuals would use that to capture spirits to have their own power over nature. So it became very clear to people that vocalization was good for memorization and passing on information and was also good for capturing the, the, the power of spirits and the word and even in the Bible said God said there was the word and the word created everything. So Om and out of Om came the Big Bang, the universe. So the word manifests power. In the Greek community, uh, the more vowels there is in the word, the more power. Uh, my name is Mr. Natural, and when I started cutting televisions... Excuse me, Mr. Natural. Yes. Are you referring to ancient Greek community or modern Greek? Both. They, and as far back as we know, the more vowels there were in the word, the more magic that word had. Before Homer? Even before Homer. And before the Iliad and the Odyssey. Before that, writing was invented in Sumer. Right. Well, writing sprung up in different places in different cultures around the world. Some of the oldest Coptic writing and hieroglyphic writing we know uh, is some of the oldest stuff they found, you know, carved on tombs. But recently they found things like Ogham and Ogalan uh, languages, which they say predate the hieroglyphic. So uh, a lot of the early writing was actually based on sign language. The Ogham language itself, which is nothing but a bunch of uh, scratches on rocks, and for many, many years, uh, nobody knew what Ogham was. And so they'd find, they'd find these rocks that just had four lines scratched in it, kind of the way uh, we go, uh, the way we do tic tac toe, or we go, uh, we know we've done, and then we go, <coughs> and they would find these things around, <coughs> and they had absolutely no idea that it was language. What they discovered was, though, the uh, ancient, um, I think it was the, uh, the Norsemen, the uh, Vikings, used to do this thing where when they were on boats far away from somebody, they had a thing called semaphore signaling. Meet me at Joe's restaurant and we'll have some coffee. And they found out that one of the things that was important about the semaphore was the shoulders. If it was above the shoulders, it meant one thing. If it was below the shoulders, it meant something else was even with the shoulders, it meant something else. So they realized that there was a line, a horizon line, and that some of these lines went through the horizon lines and some only met the line. And some were under the line and some went through the line, and some went through the line sideways. And they began to realize that these were different letters of the alphabet. And how the line crossed the horizon line determined, and this was based on semaphore, this waving flags, so we could communicate at distances. Here in America, the oldest tradition that we know of this is Indian smoke signs. The Indians actually sent out semaphore by getting something that produced a lot of smoke and putting a blanket over it, and, series, and then later on a guy by the name of Morris came up with these things, dot, dash, dot, 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 dash, dash, dot, dash. And these are all forms of semaphore. Jack Harmon's Dharma bones they communicate from one watchtower to another, you know, like fire lookout, with right. mirrors. With mirrors, right. And that mirror language is very common, too. Um, so you can imagine there's all kinds of ways of doing this. We also know that some of the earliest forms of music actually started out as ways of making sure that your children were not eaten by the neighbors because the human race was basically cannibalistic in the oldest times. It is now believed that the reason the Neanderthals disappeared is we ate them. That we actually did intermix. We, they were not separate species. 
that, and the Neanderthals died out because we were smarter and, and more brilliant than them. The reason they died out is they were not as horny as we were, and we had more children. And our children were hungry. And when there was no food to be gotten, they would eat their neighbors. So they would eat the Neanderthals. So we now have found, and anthropologists have just recently found, that we probably ate the Neanderthals out of existence, and that many of them did intermarry. And that the reason that the Homo sapien is not as pure a race, and that some people have what we call these throwbacks, is that they had inter, inter, interracial marriage had gone on. So, you know, some guy would find a, you know, a, a, a dumb Neanderthal blonde and marry her and have kids. <laughs> and then what he'd do is, if he didn't like his mother-in-law, he'd just eat her. <laughs> Not, not, to get in, not to get too much into language, I'm trying to get back to music here though, but the point was is that a lot of these, what happened is because people ate people, and there was a lot of cannibalism, and also a lot of empathy uh, between tribes, that quite often if you, tried, if you crossed over into someone else's territory, they would take you as a prisoner, and chances are you would wind up in their communal pot as, uh, as supper that night. So what happened is when the children would go out into the forests or into the jungles, to play, they would lose, as it got towards twilight, they couldn't figure out the way home. And if they just happened to cross the river in the wrong thing and wound up on the other side, they either became slaves or dinner or some other tribe. So early tribes found out that they could take logs, hollow out logs, and beat a rhythm on the log. Boop, 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 boop. And that's the Ogawa tribe. And someone went boop, 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 boop. And that was this other tribe. And then what happens is if people left the village, they could listen for these signals and follow the signal safely home. We also have the same tradition here in America with church bells. Church bells weren't about getting people to church. They were fire alarms to let people know that the whole town was on fire so people could come and carry water to put it out. They were ways of getting people together to have mass communication. We ring the bell, everybody comes, boom, we have a gathering, we can talk about it. Uh, the drums, the taika, taika drums, these huge, huge Japanese drums, were originally built in monasteries to bring the monks to the monastery, and then later used as a form of meditating on the rhythm to, for meditation purposes. Then it, then it became religious, then it and later became musical. So drums were some of the first things that were invented. A blown horns, such as the didgeridoo, uh, Aborigines found hollowed out trees, and, and they blow on them, play one note, and then they get this one note going, and then they do things like they bark, and then they do things like alligator, and sing. And they could take one note, and it is very typical for an aborigine who can play didgeri to have 50,000 songs. Imagine creating 50,000 songs out of one note. And these things then went from just gathering people around and being sort of safety mechanism to make sure people got home safe to actually encoding language and expressing the language. Now we could beat a drum which told a message and send that message as far as we could hear. We could stand on a ship with lights and swing these lights around and talk to another ship way out there in the fog. People could be out to sea and other people on the land and you could communicate. So it was the first form of long distance telephone, if you will. I heard about this man to go into Africa and he hears all these drum beats and hears all these drum beats and he, he, he can't figure out what, what is, why is all these drum beats. So he finally sees a drummer coming up after about 24 hours and he says, what are you guys beating voices? It's the only way to drum out that uh, to drum out the bass solo. <laughs> to drum out the what? To drum out the bass solo. The bass solo? To drum out the bass solo. Yeah. Drummed out the bass solo. Is that true? <laughs> that reminds me of uh, how do you stop a guitar player from playing? Sure. Put music in front of them. <laughs> uh, how do you stop a classical pianist from playing? Take the music, Take the music away. away. <laughs> And that, that right there sums up uh, what I have found to be the problem with the way music is taught as a, as a mechanical thing. Because you have people who learn to read and they cannot improvise. 
then you have people who learn to read by ear or play by ear, and they actually start to defend their ignorance, saying that this is a good thing. And so when you get these two, these two camps, and what it really is is some people have a left brain approach to the music, and some have a right brain approach to the music. And although we have two brains, we only have one mind. And although there's a lot of us here, and there's a whole lot of stuff in the world that we know of, and there's a big universe out there, don't forget that there's only one everything. So we can't escape. And even when people die, we want to know if their consciousness passes on. Well, of course it does, because there's only one everything. How can that consciousness which you had suddenly escape the universe? It may not be in your body, but it's still present. So since there's one everything... <laughs> what if there are more than one universe? Oh, well, that's still, there's one everything. That includes, there's one everything everywhere all at once. To put it in all three dimensions. It's like a paradox. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, Oxymoronical, which are, which are so, like uh, jumbo shrimp or military intelligence, <laughs> calculated chaos. Those seem to be higher truths. But to get back to what we're saying, you can see that actually a lot of instrumentation was used as fire alarms and for signaling and for tele telecommunications. You know, again, that other one, telephone, tele. Teletype, telephone, and teleclean are the three fastest forms of communication. So in those days, they used to have the beat on the drum, which was it'll ring the bell or whatever. Later, those actually became ritualized, and they became part of a culture. And another thing is the rhythms that were used were unique to the language. If they spoke a certain type of language, it had clicks and pops in it, then when they beat rhythms on the drums, they would find rhythms that had the clicks and pops in it where someone else who spoke a different language that had a different meter to that language would add those rhythms into what they were saying. And cultural differences became imbued or just locked into, if you will, like time and space housed together, became locked into the culture, became locked into the music itself. And so we had different cultures around the world having different rhythms and different scales, which we now use, based on the language that they spoke. So Russians, when they do jazz, have a slightly different kind of rhythm, a more hard-edged, push type of rhythm than when you hear in New Orleans, where they're more laid back and drinking a little whiskey and <laughs> getting loose, kitty with it. <laughs> that if they play the same song, you can hear slightly different rhythmic intent because of the language and the culture and the politics and the entire history of whoever that person is and where they come from becomes put, put into that. So, so music actually came later. Now the earliest musical instruments that we know of, besides beating on logs and big drums and, and bells, believe it or not, besides the tree, the log, the didgeridoo, which we know, we trace that back at least 60,000 years. That's one of the oldest melodic instruments we know of, the next thing that people played were bugs. Crickets, grasshoppers, beetles. I actually have some photos at my shop, if you come over sometime I'll show you, from a book called um, The Music of the Whole Earth, in which an anthropologist went around back in the 1840s taking pictures of these tribes, and these people had taken small bugs, little beetles, and tied them to a string and held them in front of their mouth, and the beetle would vibrate its wings, and they would open their mouth and make a sounding board. And by changing the shape of their mouth, they'd get The juice harp came later. The bug came first, the juice harp came later. And then what happened is they replaced the bug, which were not terribly reliable, and it was hard to get all these bugs in tune. <laughs> so it was more difficult to play harmony. So people replaced them with blades of grass. Blades of grass, pieces of leaves. And the juice harp was born. And again, if you look around the world, you will see there are literally... Where's your shop located? Pardon? Where's your shop located? Uh, um, hey, I'll give it to you after the thing. Um, juice harps actually developed, and if you look at juice, I have a friend who collects juice harps. There are tens of thousands of juice harps. 
These, and they're made out of everything from animals, bones, uh, to beautiful pieces of carved wood and ivory, and some even stone and jade. Some I saw a beautiful jade piece where you had to take a blade of a certain type of grass and put it in there to play it, and it sounded exactly like a kazoo. So kazoos are another example of, of that type of a thing where you have some kind of a piece of paper or membrane and you're humming, and you're humming through it. Now the thing about all these instruments is the most number of notes they could get out of it was about five notes. By changing the shape of my mouth, I could only get about five notes. And those first five notes that they got, we know as the pentatonic scale. Da, 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 da. And the range of the bug in the instruments in the mouth was about five notes. So the pentatonic scale became one of the first scales used, and it became very popular. In 535 AD, a guy by the name of Pythagoras, who was a brilliant mathematician, actually studied vibrating strings. And he discovered that if you take a string and you lengthen it to double its length, that it gave you the same note twice as low. And if you took that string and cut it in half, it gave you the same note twice as high, and you got what we call the octave. He then discovered that if you take the, the string, and let's say it's a certain mass, made of one, one gram, and you double the weight to make it two grams, it vibrated at half the frequency and pr produced an octave, another note that sounded the same, below. If you took and cut the weight in, in, in half, it doubled in frequency. So if I went from a one gram weight to a half gram, it would double in pitch. He also found out that if you put a certain amount of tension, he would take one string and tie it on one end and put it over a pulley and then put weights on it. And he put like two pounds of weights on and plucked the string and then on another string exactly the same thing, he put four pounds. And he found out that he got a note that was twice as high. So as long as the mass was doubled or half, as long as the length was doubled or half, and as long as the tension on the string was doubled or half, we always got the same note. And that didn't make for very interesting scales. <laughs> then what Pythagoras discovered is what we call in, what I call in music, the magic threes or the odd number. In music, it turns out that odd numbers are more normal than even numbers. And that odd numbers actually produce new things. So he discovered that when he cut the string in thirds, or in two-thirds lengths, he produced a new note that was exactly five steps away from the old one. So if we have one, two, three, four, five, one, five, one, five. So if I take a string and cut off one-third of it, so I have two-thirds, I would produce a new note that's five notes higher than that note. And then what he did is he took that one and cut off a third of it to get another one, cut off a third of it to get another one, and got this very unusual looking instrument that kind of looked like this. And it was called a harp. And by taking five fifths, or five fifths, five taking the, the string and dividing it into thirds five times, and making that as a new one, doing it again and again and again, they got five brand new notes before it came back to the octave again and produced what we now know the first scientific tuning of the pentatonic scale. Now, in our music system, I use numbers. This would be one, two, three, five, six, and then the octave one. Da 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 da. And we're going to do more about that in a couple of weeks, and we'll explain more about this because that is the first scale which our genetic code will allow us to lock into and be able to sing successfully as a group. And from this pentatonic scale to this day, rock and roll guitar players use that pentatonic scale almost exclusively to create all the jams that you're hearing. So when you're hearing this they're using this pentatonic scale. They're going back to this earlier scale. Another nice thing about this scale is it has such beautiful harmonies that you can't play a wrong note out of place anywhere and any note you play always sounds right. And if I pluck any two or any three of these, it harmonizes with each other. Also the first important chord that we know of, the major chord, one, three, five, one, five, three, one, da, 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 is also inside of that. And a good way to learn to hear major chords 
is this thing, the pentatonic scale, and then just skip. And we'll be doing some of that in the next couple of classes, okay, as we do the singing stuff. Now, to get to what we're doing tonight, we use a lot of techniques which are forms of call and response called imitation. So what were we doing that was imitation? <laughs> Do y'all remember what you said? Rhythms. <laughs> the rhythms. Yeah, the rhythm, we did rhythms. I would try to tap something and you guys would tap something, right? So that was imitation. What else did we use imitation? Car gestures. gestures. Thank you. Gestures. We did gesture imitation. Palm dancing is known as mirroring, and that's a specific type of imitation in which the two people are exactly mirror images from each other. So when one person is doing something with their right hand, the other person is doing the same thing with their left hand, and you will see right here in my hands, this is the model for that mirror. Our hands are not built like this. <laughs> They're not built like this. Our hands are built like this. And throughout our entire body, our left side and our right side mirror each other. Bilateral symmetry. Yeah, bilateral symmetry. Also, futures triggers use put and calls. Puts and calls. Right, puts and calls, right. But there's a, a technique in jazz known as give and take, which we'll be working on in the near future. It's a little bit more complicated, but you'll find that 90% of all the compositional tools that we can use to make very simple music beautiful and work are imitation. Now, one thing we didn't try is, in this last jam that we were doing, I gave you, you know, I gave you something and you, you played it over and over and I gave you something and I gave each of you something. You imitated me and then you kept it going. Then I came up to each of you and I said, do your own thing. You know, jam. I wanted you to have something successful that could cook and you felt comfortable before you started jamming. I've tried it in the past where I just had people try to jam and it's just horrible. What, what? It's hard for people to synchronize and get in on, on the beat with each other, get, get with what's happening. So it took it take time. So by giving, by giving you something to imitate, and then giving you the ability to spontaneously, you know, free associate off of that, you're able to make your own stuff up safe. You have six minutes to teach us to write poetry. I will. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay. So uh, imitation, right? Now. We were talking about code words. This is what the first code word looks like. Is this a, a lock on it? So here's the first code word, drum. Now please look at this lexical unit, the symbol, and the word, drum. Whenever you see Drum, drum, drum. You will write that down. Drum, okay? It's a P. Yeah, you, well, if you want to call it a quarter note, you can go right in that there. But, but I, I, don't, I, I don't think you can teach uh, two-year-olds uh, fractions. And you can't groove with fractions. This is the other word we used, Tarzan. You'll see that if they're tied together, that the stems are tied together. Tarzan, Tarzan. It's two syllables in one beat. Two syllables in one beat. Right? And then the other code word that we used was this one called alligator. Now you'll notice that alligator has double flags. The way we can tell single flags, the, the way you can tell a Tarzan from an alligator, besides it being four, 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 four syllables instead of two, is this one has a single tie across the top, this one has a double tie. Okay? Now, if you want to be able to dictate rhythm, here's how it goes. All of these things have a stem on them. So watch. If I do this, and I just did this with the blackboard, bum, 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 I've now written that rhythm. All I need to do is tie together those two things, put a little X here, and now what do I have? Drum, Tarzan, Tarzan, drum. Right? Okay, what about this one? What was it? Alligator, Tarzan, Tarzan. Alligator, Tarzan, Tarzan, drum. So watch, I'll make the same sound with the pen. Did you hear it? 
Okay, so then all I do is this. And I just wrote the rhythm, didn't I? Okay, one more time. You ready? <coughs> one more time. Tarzan drum, alligator Tarzan. You got it? Right, I'm going to give you one and then I want you to write it down. And your homework assignment is to go home and take these whole code words and write up at least two rhythm patterns using four beats, using those code words that you think cooks. Something that you can have some fun with. And bring it back with you next week. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some of this out here. I'm just going to throw out code words and have you write them down. Then we're going to take the rhythms that you wrote, and we're going to have other people play them to see if what you wrote, you can hear other people play it. And then we're going to actually use those rhythms in the jams to start jamming with. And we will imitate each other by just simply looking over your shoulder and seeing what you wrote down and copying. We'll, we'll, we'll cheat. Okay? Got it? Now, here's one for you to write down. Again. What did you all hear? So if you go boom, 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 tie, tie. Now I use X's because I like to write fast. And you'll see a lot of drum parts are written with X's at the bottom. But if you take the time to make a little circle, it'll look exactly like notes. The only difference. Okay, when I listen, when I go out to a band or I'm listening to a, a record or I hear something on the radio and I'm hearing ba da dum ba da 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 dum dum, I go ba ba bum ba 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 bum bum, and then I look at it and go, oh, hmm, and outline the code words. And then in almost real time, I can write down rhythmically what I'm hearing. If I then think of it again, ba da dum pi da 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 dum bum, I can hear the up and downness and start finding out what pentatonic numbers were, I can then push those notes up and down onto the music staff and write a piece of music. And it's that simple, folks. It shouldn't be any harder than that. So our goal is, I'm going to teach you to hear this pentatonic scale. I'm going to teach you to hear these rhythms and write them down. In future classes, we're going to then take and learn to put them on the staff with numbers, push them around and invent little melodies of our own, and then learn to hear each other's melodies and copy from each other. And then I'm going to show you how to orchestrate that how to take four people and get them to play together as a band and take their rhythms and take the little melodies that they've written and build it up into whole pieces. And try to show you that it starts with a simple little unit building onto the next unit onto the next unit. Thank you all for coming tonight. Please put your chairs away.